Good morning. I'm glad you can take some time this morning for worship, and I have no announcements, and so we're going to jump right in. Today we're uh, looking at one of the questions that comes up as the lead up to Easter, and it, we can take some time on the other side of it to contemplate it. Why is it that Judas betrayed Jesus? I want to ponder that question with you today, but I want to ponder it in a certain way, because there's a lot of unknowns, there's a lot of things we don't understand about what exactly it is that happened. And so I'm going to tell you about the situation, some context, and I'm going to give you some options. And it's going to be like, uh, if you ever read the old Choose Your Own Adventure books, uh, the way that those were books where you would read a page, and at the end of the page it would say, if you want to enter the cave, turn to page 23. And if you don't want to enter the cave, turn to page 35. And um, there, there were books that I read a lot growing up. And, and this is going to be like, choose your own ending sermon. I'm going to tell you a bit about Judas. And then you're going to decide what you think. And I'll give you the different endings to the sermon based upon what you think. So uh, this is obviously exper an experiment. We'll see how it goes. Let's start with the situation. And, like, wh what is the situation that, that they're in? Right? As Judas follows Jesus into Jerusalem, they're walking up into the city that is at the heart of Israel. They know that uh, they're not just entering the city for this most holy of celebrations, Passover. They're also entering occupied territory. Right? The Roman Empire knows that it must control Jerusalem. This is an imperative for the health of the empire. Like, from the point of view of the Roman Empire, which at that point was all across uh, northern Africa, then up what we now call the Middle East, and then through Greece and Italy and over into Spain, like that whole, all that land that surrounds the Mediterranean Sea, uh, Romans were not known for their naval power. Like, they just didn't do a lot on the seas. They, they just marched everything. They transported everything by land. And the breadbasket of the Roman Empire of the Mediterranean area was Egypt. And they needed that grain, that bread, to get all the way up to Rome. Because in Rome, to be a Roman citizen in Rome meant that you were given uh, grain as part of, of, of the patronage system. The, the patrons, the pe powerful people, controlled the politics of the day by giving out grain to the people who supported them. And, and so they had to have the grain. And if you look at a map, the way you get grain from Egypt is you got to go around and up through it where Israel is and then over to it, modern day Italy. And Jerusalem is on top of a mountain and looks down and controls the trade route that connects Egypt to Rome. And so for the stability of the Roman politics, for the stability of the Roman Empire, they must control Jerusalem. And there's another reason they have to control Jerusalem. Both Alexander the Great and the Greek empires that had come before Rome, uh, and then Rome itself, uh, whenever they had looked off to the east, that is where they had always hit their natural limits. If you think of trying to go across what we now call the Middle East and the deserts and all of that, like and Alexander the Great went a conquering, he went east, and eventually he had to stop and come back. The territory defeated him, right? You, you, the, the geography itself defeated him, in a sense. And, uh, and, and that's what Rome experienced as well. You, they just could not expand to the east. They could expand up north into Germany and Britain. They could expand south into across, across northern Africa. But, but they hit that same hard limit. Like They couldn't go further south because they hit the deserts of Africa. And they couldn't go further east because they hit... Uh, the, the, what, what was east of Israel, all, all the deserts that way. But off that way, it's not like no one was out there. The Persian Empire was out there. There had been a, a succession of empires based out of the east, the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire. And uh, the Persian Empire had come in and caused amazing problems for the, the Greek Empire, which was the, where, which is around the Mediterranean, and that's where the, the Roman Empire was now. And so Rome not only had to control Israel, 
so that the grain must flow. They also had to control Israel and Jerusalem because Jerusalem was the exposed city on the eastern flank of the empire. And, and so if, if the eastern empire is going to come invading, the first place they're going to hit is Jerusalem. And if they can cop, capture and hold Jerusalem, then they can control the flow of grain. And, and so Rome must control Jerusalem. And so as Judas is going up with Jesus into Jerusalem, it would have been this, this crazy tension because it is the high point of the people who's coming to the city, a lot of religious fervor, a lot of kids having a good time and parents chasing after them, but also a lot of very nervous looking soldiers because the last time that the, the Jewish people had led a revolt was not too far in the past. Back in 167 BC, the Maccabeans, a, 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 a family of priests and leaders had led the revolt to kick off the control of the last empire that had controlled uh, Jerusalem and Israel, the Seleucid em Empire, which was a, the, a flavor of Greek empire. And so now that um, Rome had come in and, and controlled Jerusalem, it wasn't too many generations back that the Jewish people had kicked off an invading force led by religious leaders. And so Rome knows that if this religious fervor gets too wound up, gets too tight, gets too, uh, people get too involved with this last time, that had led to the Jewish people kicking out the last people who had conquered Jerusalem. And Rome didn't want to repeat that mistake. Right? They, they were going to have a kind of a light hand. They're not going to make it hard for Jerusalem, but they were going to be very aware of what was happening there. And they, had, they didn't have a bunch of soldiers in Jerusalem, but they had them close by so they could swoop in, or as much as you can swoop when you're trying to march 6,000 men legions. But the point being, like they're all right there watching. And it turns out, like they, Judas and Jesus and the rest of the disciples had no way of knowing this, but their, the concerns about the tension and the sense that a religious revolt could cause a huge problem end up being validated in 70 AD, just shy of 40 years later from, from the events of Holy Week and Easter. There's this guy who takes on the name Bar Kokhba, son of the stars, who leads a revolt against Rome and it blows up. Rome brings in their legions and tears down the temple, like the temple in Jerusalem that is torn down to this day was torn down in 70 AD when Bar Kokhba, this Jewish religious leader, leads a revolt and the Roman legions come in and Bar Kokhba and, and all of his followers are just destroyed, decimated, and, and then they are chased up onto uh, Masada. If you ever the History Channel loves to run specials on this right around Easter, it seems. Like the, the revolt, and they go to Masada, and they all are, are killed. It, it is this horrible moment, right? And so that, that, the concern about what could happen if, there, if a religious leader uh, starts leading some sort of revolt or some sort of uprising against the, the Roman Empire is entirely valid because it does happen in a generation, and it just blows up. And so Judas and Jesus and the rest of the disciples are going into Jerusalem. And uh, the first decision you've got to make today, you, got a lot, you have a couple decisions to make about Judas. Here's the first one you've got to make. Was when it comes to Judas's last name, what does it mean? So last names. My mother's maiden name is Fletcher. And in sort of ancient, more uh, even Middle, uh, Middle Ages, Dark Ages times, like a last name of Fletcher would mean that you fletched arrows. You put the, the fletching, the, the, um, the feathers on an arrow. Like the last name, because people didn't travel as much, the last name was like the last name of, of what you did or where you were or who you are. It wasn't, it wasn't last names the way we use them today. And so, like my last name, as the pastor in Shelbina, it'd be like Andrew Pastor or something like that, or Andrew of Shelbina. It's just, that would be a, probably how I'd be named today. And so, Judas Iscariot. What's that mean? 
So Iscariot either means that Judas is a rather bold individual who has taken on the name of the Sicarii, which is a group of Sicca wielding assassins. A Sicca is um, a Sicca is a type of knife. Like this is a kind of a low key knife. It's just kind of a pocket knife. Imagine a knife that is curved forward and double-edged on, on both sides, so a dagger, and so you could use it to stab people in the back, or if you wanted to assassinate a Roman soldier, if you got it across their throat, because it was curved towards the, the person, you, when you, you got it across their throat, the, the blade would actually hold the person against the, the edge. It, it's, it's about, it really is as vicious as it sounds. And so the Sakari are a group of zealots who are uh, fighting to throw off the Roman control. They are assassinating and killing uh, and terrorizing uh, Roman soldiers and uh, anyone who is sympathizers. And so Judas Iscariot could be that he is a rather bold person who is willing to publicly take on the name of the Sakari, the Saka, uh, wielding uh, opponents, enemies of Roman occupation. So that's one way to see Judas. The other way to understand the last name, and we don't know which one is accurate, like we just don't know, is that it is Judas not of the wielder of the Sicca, but Judith of Carioth. Iscariot is a form of Carioth, which is like a suburb of Jerusalem, you'd think of it as. Like we, what we think of as like a suburb of, of St. Louis today. It, it's, a, it's a place where good, upstanding, upright people live and, and good museums and good schools and good churches. And, and you go there and you get a good education and good people. And, um, and, and so he's an upstanding, priestly, uh, trained, educated person, right? And that's a completely different way of seeing Judas. And so that's your first decision. Is he a dagger wielding ne'er do well, or is he uh, a zealot, or is he a kind of uh, very highly educated, uh, knows the right people type of uh, upper crust of society type of person? Okay, think about it, make your decision. Which one do you think it's going to be? And let's move along. Uh, Let's move along and let's look at what the Gospels tell us about Judas. It's surprisingly little. If we look at what the Gospels say about uh, Judas, the Gospel of Mark, who is the, uh, the dragnet, just the facts, ma'am. Like, Mark just gives us the barest bones. Right? He tell, the Gospel according to Mark tells us, Mark 14, Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went off to the chief priests in order to betray Jesus. They were glad when they heard this and promised to give him money, and Judas began seeking how to betray him. That's it. We don't get anything more from Mark. Okay, let's move on to another gospel. Let's go to the Gospel of Luke and see if Luke has a little bit more to inform us about with this. Luke 22. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is called the Passover, was approaching. The chief priests and the scribes were seeking how they might put him to death, for they were afraid of the people. Afraid of the people who are following him that might lead to this religious revolt, because the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem also know the score. They know the tension here. So, okay, continuing on. And Satan entered into Judas, who was called Iscariot, belonging to the number of the twelve. And he went away and discussed with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. They were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and began seeking a good opportunity to betray him to them apart from the crowd. So Luke gives us this detail that Satan enters Judas. Yet this is a different thing than other places in, in Scripture where... Um, we talk about demon possession in the New Testament, and we've, I've talked about this before, like demon possession, and I put that in the same category as like, uh, the same way of describing the reality of like uh, mental illness, bipolar, schizophrenia, I mean, just the problems that our minds can have, the things that are real, but we can't touch, and, and they would talk about demons, we talk about mental illness, and they, 
there, that, that's what's going on here. That, that's, not, that's not what we see here. What we see here is Judas still remaining very calm and in control. And so it feels like a different thing. But Luke doesn't really give us much more to work with. Let's go to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, and remembering the Gospel of John is the, the last of the Gospels written, the, gospel, the, the author of the Gospel, John, has had the most time to reflect on the why and really think through what has happened, and it shows, because the Gospel of John makes a connection here. Uh, it, it's First we read in John 12, Jesus therefore six days before the Passover came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And so they made him supper there, and Martha was serving, but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief, and as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. So we are given this detail about Judas, that according to John's recollection and understanding, Judas had already chosen to do some dark things. Now he is talking a good talk. Why didn't this money get put aside for the poor? While he is filfer, pilfering, the, the, the translation is stealing, uh, money. Uh, from the, the disciples, from what Jesus is doing. It makes more sense then of this moment that happens in John 13, the next chapter. And Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God and was going back to the God, got up from the supper, laid aside his garments, taking a towel, he girded himself. And then it goes on to tell uh, the foot washing that happens at, at the Last Supper. And so there's this sense there that uh, Judas had already chosen a dark path. He'd already chosen to steal. Uh, and then having done so, he had taken a step down that road. Then uh, he had opened the door to temptation and temptation struck. And he has opened the door to uh, doing things that ought not be done and so he went ahead and did more things that ought not to be done. And so John is the gospel that makes this, this connection for us. Uh, the gospel of Matthew gives us some more context as well, but it feels a bit different than John. It feels different. Listen to this. One of the twelve named Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me to betray him to you? And they weighed out 30 pieces of silver and from then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to betray Jesus. That's in Matthew 26, which reads much like the other Gospels. But if we listen to what happens at the Last Supper with Matthew, the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. Now when the evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve disciples, and as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. Being deeply grieved, they each began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. And he answered, He who dipped his hand with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me. The Son of Man is to go, just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And Judas, who was betraying him, said, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. And Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. And then they go on. The next thing Jesus does is takes bread and breaks it and gives it to them and says, this is my body broken for you. And so right there in the middle <coughs> of the first time communion happens, Judas is told by Jesus that he knows what is happening. And Judas says, surely not I. And then at the end of Matthew, uh, Matthew 27, then when Judas, had, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. So Matthew does make sure to point out that 
Judas does feel remorse and he gave the money back. And so there's more going on here than Judas just wanting a few dollars. And that's it. The Gospels do not tell us anything more, which is frustrating. And so based upon this information, what I've told you, which is a decent survey of what we know about Judas, people have developed some theories about why Judas betrayed Jesus. And, and let me share, you which, share them with you. I, here are the five theories of betrayal that I have found uh, that seem to hold up to some basic scrutiny. Right? And, and so you've made, you've made up your mind whether you think he is, is that sort of dagger-wielding zealot or whether he's like a priestly, trained, educated, uh, upscale, whatever. Right? Keep that in mind. Here is theory one. Judas is just protecting his people. Like Judas knows that if this goes bad and there's a revolt, it could go very bad. It could get really ugly. And so he sees Jesus being all naive and being like, you know what, the kingdom of God's coming. And, and Judas says, but those Roman legions over there don't have much, they don't care about your kingdom. They got big swords. Like, what do we have, right? And so Judas, as an act of self-preservation for his people, Sort of the, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. Yes, I was quoting Spock there. Uh, that Judas makes this decision that he will betray Jesus because it is the way for him to save his people. And if you want to see this in, in film, go watch Jesus Christ Superstar and sing along to that amazing slap bass. Uh, it's still kind of depressing in the end, though, because Judas is just... Yeah, like Judas has to step in. Jesus is causing a ruckus, throwing tables around in the temple. Like, he just has to step in and, and, and handle it because Jesus is just too naive. That's theory one. Theory two is that Judas is stuck. Judas is just stuck. The devil has gotten into Judas and he is doomed and he can't do anything else. And he, he might try to turn from one side to the other, but he has to keep going forward with this path that's in front of him. Satan has entered him and he is now, it's just his path, right? I got to say that the uh, youth group loved this one. This is their favorite. Like it, the, the, they, they went for the, the dagger-wielding Judas, so the demon-possessed dagger-wielding Judas got their attention. I don't blame them. It's kind of... Yeah, it gets your attention, right? But this is the idea that, that once Judas was down, went down this dark path, he was, there was no way for him to turn away from it. Um, okay. And if you want to see this, this is, in the God, this is in the musical Godspell, the way that this is portrayed. Theory three. It was a backroom deal. Jesus pulls Judas aside and says, man, I need you to do me a solid. I need you to do something for me. I need you to go. It doesn't make sense. I just need you to go take care of this thing. Go, go tell the priests where I'm going to be. Right? It's a backroom deal that makes Judas less of a bad guy. It makes him the tragic hero, the one who does what Jesus needs when Jesus can't let on to anyone else. This is in Martin Scorsese's The Last Temptation of Christ, which I've read about. I haven't watched. I don't intend to watch. And I should tell you that I'm giving you some film references uh, because that, that's the most easily accessible versions of these. Uh, there are other people over the centuries who have had these lines of thought. I'm just not giving you the entire bibliography. Theory four is that Judas got played. He just got played. The Sadducees, which is the ruling priests of Jerusalem, uh, they control the Sanhedrin, the group of 70 that, that control, uh, they, they control the high priests. Like they, they are the ones who, who maintain the religious call, which is essential for all the reasons we've covered. That the, the Sadducees, they, they are talking to Judas, and Ju this makes a lot more sense if Judas is like that highly trained, upper class type of like educated, and so they, they, they get along, like the Sadducees are highly trained, educated, all that. They get along, and the Sadducees tell G Judas, you know, we just want to talk to him. Just bring him on in. We just want to talk to him. This is not going to be a problem. Just, just, not, just bring him in, right? And Judas gets played. And uh, this is, I've seen this on the History Channel, one of the History Channel specials on this. So again, they seem to run these specials always near Easter, and yeah. 
Theory five, Judas thinks he's the hero. Judas thinks he's the hero, and this takes a little bit more explanation. Uh, in the stories of the Jewish people, one of the most important stories is the story of Abraham, the father of the Jewish people. And Abraham, at one point, uh, offers his son Isaac. Offers, God tells him, I need you to sacrifice your son Isaac. And so he takes Isaac and he puts him on the altar. He builds an altar, puts him on the altar, and he has bound him, and, and he picks, holds up his knife. And an angel cries out and says, stop, stop. I, I, I see that you are devoted. And, uh, and here's a ram. Sacrifice this ram stuck in the bushes over here. And Isaac has returned to Abraham alive. And the ram is sacrificed and said, and God's will is done because now Isaac is going to be the father, uh, the, the next in line, the next of the patriarchs. And if uh, this story sounds like it is complicated and we're not quite sure what to do with it, it is a whole I spent an entire semester studying this, and I still don't think I f understand it. I don't think it can be fully understood. But this, uh, this idea that Abraham sacrifices the person who is most precious to him, and, and God returns him alive, and, and that is what uh, Judas does here. He sees himself as a second Abraham, that he is going to be the hero. He is going to be the one that sacrifices, sacrifices uh, Jesus, and, and it will be the way that Jesus will be able to gather the Romans together and, and, and turn against them and, and do what Jesus needs to do to begin the kingdom of God and create this crisis by which Jesus can step forward and, and be uh, the, the, the Messiah that Judas expects him to be. And, and so Judas will then be the hero he has been the one to bring this all to pass. And it is utterly tragic because Judas uh, is not the hero and Jesus is, is the hero. And it is the, the arrogance of the moment, the arrogance of Judas, that he is the one who is doing this. He is the one who is executing God's will. Uh, ex let's, that, that's a horrible word to use right there. He is the one who is doing God's will here. And um, so that's why Judas does that. So there you go, the five theories. We don't know which one is most accurate. I, I can't tell you. Like, I can tell you what some people prefer. Um, each one has its advantages and disadvantages, right? I'm, I'm not a big fan, personally, of the second theory, the theory that um, Judas had no choice, because I kind of like this decision. Like, I, I like that, I mean, God, as a heavenly father, as parents do, you raise children and you entrust them to make decisions and then they have to bear the consequences of their decisions. And so I don't, I'm not a big fan of that second theory that Judas had no, no choice. However, you look back across scripture and you see something like God hardening Pharaoh's heart after, so I, I don't know. I'm also not a big fan of the, uh, the, the backroom deal, the theory three, um, because I don't see the Bible sugarcoating or, uh, make, or hiding a lot. The Bible is very blunt in telling the stories of the people of God. Um, but, you know, that, that, that's my preference. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. So think about it. Like, you have, you have your, of your five theories, you, got your, you, you picked out which one you want, right? Judas is protecting uh, Jerusalem from a naive Jesus. That uh, Judas is stuck, theory two. Theory three, it was all the plan. Jesus pulls Judas aside and tells him, I need you to do something for me. By theory four, Judas got played. In theory five, Judas is, thinks he's the hero. Right? You, picked your, you picked your ending, or you picked your, uh, your theory? Okay, here's your ending. If you've picked theory one, to follow Jesus is to be committed to a way of life that the rest of the world will call, will call naive. And yet Paul tells us and reminds us that to the rest of the world it looks like foolishness to us is the power of Christ. It is the power of salvation. And we live this way because it is the way of the kingdom of God and all that is cynical, all that is broken is passing. And we lean into following the ways of Jesus Christ, the ways of forgiveness and mercy and justice, trusting that in the end it is not naive, it is what is true and good. Amen. Okay, that's theory one. There's your ending. If you like theory two, here, here's your ending for you. My friends, we must be aware 
that when we open up our lives to the small sins in life, that there, there's a word for what happens when small things become bigger things and they spread. We call that word metastasis. It's the word that talk, we talk about how sin, sp uh, cancer spreads and, and, and can go from organ to organ and sin can spread just like that. Little problems can become big problems. And so I, I encourage you to do what is needed to maintain your relationship to God, to do the things to seek God's holiness, to, to redouble our efforts and our commitments to be people of prayer and study and service by filling us ourselves up with the grace and the goodness of God. We are driving out that which distracts us so that we do not give Satan a place to even get involved in our lives, so that we get caught up in the kingdom of God and seek that kingdom first. Amen. Get it? That was your ending for your second theory. The third theory that it was all just a plan. Man, I struggle with this one. It would be some, an ending with this one. I just don't believe it. Of all of the five theories, this is the one I believe the least. Uh, the ending would be something like, God has a plan, just trust it. But that's not how I roll, because I believe, yeah, I don't know. I, I just, I don't know. I, I'll, I'll, if I can think of a better way to end that one, that the J Jesus pulls Judas aside and makes a backroom deal, I'll let you know. I don't have a good ending for you. I'm sorry. Theory four, Judas got played. Jesus tells us that we are to be as shrewd as serpents and gentle as doves. And nowhere do we see this more clear, clearly than what happened with Judas. Like Judas meant well, he meant well, but you know, meaning well and doing well can be two very different things. And so part of following Jesus, part of being salt and light to the world, part of being in mission to the world is not only becoming people who can be focused on what it is that Jesus calls us to do, but further to become people who understand the challenges in the, the challenges of the world. So we go forth to be as wise as serpents and as gentle as doves. Amen. Okay, theory five. Judas thinks he's the hero. Humility, above all else, is at the core of what we cultivate as Christians. We, we spend the first chunk of our lives figuring out who we are, and then we spend, hopefully, the rest of our Christian lives following Jesus, figuring out how, whose we are and, and how we live in light of that, that it is not about me, that I am not the hero of my story, that I am living the most true, beautiful, and good way of life when it, and Jesus is the hero, and I'm the one who is following in his footsteps. And so, like, uh, like John the Baptist, we must repeat after him, I must become lesser so that Christ might become greater. Amen. And? Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Judas is a, a conundrum. We don't know what happened with him. And so help us as we ponder that we might learn uh, something, even if we don't all learn the same thing, uh, that we might be able to be drawn closer to you in the, in, the, in the pondering. We pray for grace for this day, for healing for those who are sick, and for wisdom for those who lead us in these challenging times. Amen. Thank you for putting up and enduring my little experiment in how do I preach about Judas. And uh, May the grace of God be with you this day and always.